am very delighted today to host uh, Graham Dunkley, the first time we are hosting a speaker from Australia. And uh, he made a, quite a journey. I don't know when he described the journey. It was San Francisco, then to Los Angeles by train and bus, and from uh, or San Francisco, from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and then from San Francisco by by train to Chicago, and then and then then to Boston, and then he ended up here in Portland. So it took him a long time and a long journey to come and give a lecture here. So. Uh, uh, Graham Dunkley studied at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, where he earned a PhD in economics and labor history. He was a senior lecturer for many years in economics at Victoria University in Melbourne. He has also worked as a freelance journalist and with non-government organizations, especially in India. He is currently an independent scholar and writer. His most recent book, uh, some of you may have it here with you. It's a world war, one world mania, a critical guide to free trade, finance, financialization, and over globalization. It was published by Z Books in London. Dr. Dunkley is a widower and lives with his daughter, Kiran, in the beautiful Yarra Ranges region outside Melbourne. And one of the reasons I, 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 I selected him to come and give a lecture is because during the presidential election, there was a lot of discussion about globalization, uh, but from a different perspective, maybe. And so I thought maybe his, his topic, the things he works on, would be relevant uh, to our times and the political conversations that are going on. So please help me welcome Dr. Dunkley to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Anwar. I'm uh, delighted to be here and uh, thank uh, Anwar for his kind invitation to bring me here uh, and from the other side of the world and um, to Danielle who helped organise a lot of this and so on. Uh, when I was first invited, you people probably know that you have a, a namesake rival mm -hmm. in this country. When I was first uh, telling people in Australia that I've been invited to give a lecture in Portland in the USA, everyone said, oh, Portland, Oregon. Even in America, some people were saying this. And I said, no, Portland, Maine. I said, oh, and uh, some people knew, but not everyone recognised that uh, it was a actually different place. <laughs> so since being here, I was thinking that uh, you people uh, were probably quite justified in doing some more PR to uh, publicise your beautiful town. It's uh, well, well justified, I would think. Anyway, I'm glad to be here and um, the, uh, I thank the Centre for Global Humanities, uh, which I've only just learnt about um, as a result of this invitation. Uh, the, the title, Anwar and I dis discussed the title, and we came up with this on um, the case against free trade and over globalisation, which sounds as though I'm sort of criticising things and so on. But uh, actually, uh, when you put it that way, it uh, clearly implies a sort of spectrum of opinion, you know. You're, uh, so globalisation and those sorts of issues is something that's subject to very strong opinions on either side. And uh, I find usually that when the strong opinions across the spectrum, the right place is usually around the middle. So I regard myself as about the middle. But uh, although Anwar said, oh, we're glad to have a left-wing perspective. And I thought, well, yes, it's interesting. I suppose it's sort of left-wing, but I still, compared with what a lot of people still say about globalisation, I'm probably closer to the middle. Uh, when uh, globalisation has been first talked about, probably from around about 1980, in the 1980s that uh, people went mad over globalisation, the 1990s was probably the peak, when one of your presidents, Bill Clinton, then uh, said lots of things about how globalisation was brilliant, uh, it's the best thing, uh, inevitable, all this kind of thing. And uh, I uh, have always been a bit sceptical about that all along, and I've written several books now uh, which is put a, I'd say a sceptical rather than a, you know, strongly anti-global view, but um, the, uh, I found that there's a, quite a bit of confusion. One thing, the sort of thing they say about globalisation is it's inevitable, you know, it's unstoppable, there's nothing you can do about it, and, uh, and it's going to be brilliant anyway, really good, whether you've uh, read uh, Friedman's works, Alexis and the Olive Tree and things like that, that's the kind of thing he said. But... Um, I'm going to take a somewhat different view. I found it rather confusing because uh, there's so many different aspects of globalisation. So what I've done is uh, divide it into... Uh, now, if I press that arrow, do I get to the first one? Yeah. I divide it into uh, two different definitions. 
First, there are dis I distinguish between internationalisation and globalisation. This is my way of doing it, but I'm finding other people are now trying to make some sort of distinction. Internationalisation for me is where um, you get closer links between countries and so on, but on the basis of countries maintaining their national sovereignty. So that uh, this ends up involving things like uh, travel and uh, knowledge flows, uh, the internet, uh, government aid to other countries and all that kind of thing. Whereas globalisation I define as integration. Globalisation is where uh, governments are deliberately trying to uh, relinquish their powers over various economic flows between countries. Uh, they're doing that because um, the theory is, and I'll touch on as I go along, that this will lead to an efficient globally integrated world economic order that uh, people have been so keen on for so long. Now, uh, I'd like to keep you to keep in mind that distinction. I think it's quite a crucial one. Internationalisation possibly is inevitable and beneficial because it's um, based on technologies of various sorts and so on. It's probably beneficial and so on. We all travel and things like that. We all use the internet. But globalisation is a different uh, matter. Globalisation is largely based on policy decisions by governments. Governments are actually what I, a term I use in some of my books, say governments are in the process of committing sovereignty suicide, I call it, because they're relinquishing many of these powers through various kinds of agreements and, and so on. So uh, as a result of that, globalisation is something that's quite different. I, I don't think it's inevitable and uh, I don't, certainly don't think it's necessarily beneficial, which will be one of my main arguments tonight. Uh, my term over globalisation, which I believe I invented, um, it's just part of this the book and part of the title of my book, is um, uh, implies, of course, that globalisation has gone too far and uh, that's certainly a major theme of mine. All right, so um, globalisation uh, has got a number of components and uh, in a short talk like this, I can't cover them all, but uh, there are four components, crucial components of uh, globalisation that we probably should keep in mind. Uh, first is uh, trade in goods and services, which is going to be my main focus. The second is foreign direct investment. Um, mostly that's done by large transnational companies. And this is where, we, of course, we get into abbreviations, foreign direct investment, usually abbreviated to FDI, transnational companies, usually TNCs. But this is long-term capital flows and uh, hopefully constructive flows of long-term investment capital, build factories and whatnot. The third one is short-term financial flows, which is usually much more speculative than long-term uh, uh, capital and um, not usually into constructive investment and so on. And uh, it's a much more controversial uh, issue. And the fourth is migration of labour or shifting of people. Now, all of these are major economic components and they have uh, different aspects to them. Uh, in a talk like this, I won't be able to go over them all. I'll touch on them as I go along, but the talk will be mainly about uh, trade in goods and services to some extent to be my main focus. In earlier times, particularly in the 19th century, uh, most international exchanges were uh, of trading and uh, migration of people. But since the Second World War, uh, there's been a huge increase in trading in services as well um, and flows of information and uh, a huge explosion, especially in the 1990s, of uh, capital flows by transnational companies, long-term capital flows. So all of this has made the global economy extremely complicated now. Policy debates about uh, trading has uh, always hinged for a long, long time, hundreds of years, uh, around the idea of free trade versus protection. You've probably heard these terms used. And uh, uh, a brief definition of those uh, as follows there. Free trade is where governments do not place much in the way of restrictions on uh, trade and uh, trading and other, other sorts of flows either. In the 19th century, there weren't many other sorts of flows. But protection uh, is where 
they do place various kinds of restrictions on uh, flows of various sorts, particularly tariffs, traditionally, that you've probably heard of. Tariffs are just uh, taxes on goods that come into your country that makes their prices higher and therefore discourages the imports of those things. Usually when governments use protection, it's because they want to try to discourage imports in some way or another in order to help your, your own industries of that country. The uh, uh, pioneering case for um, free trade um, occurred in a year that will be familiar to you Americans, the year 1776, which I, if I read the history books properly, was the year of your, the US Declaration of Independence. And the same year, the a Scottish um, philosopher and economist Adam Smith wrote a, a now very famous book, legendary book called The Wealth of Nations, uh, in which he argued, um, well, much of what we now consider to be uh, modern economic principles. But in particular, in relation to trade, there were three... Uh, what are we up to now? Um, Oh, no, sorry, that's a little bit later. There were uh, three main arguments that uh, Smith and his followers put up. Firstly, that free markets are the best way to do more or less everything, all types of transactions, free markets uncontrolled by governments. And he invented a, a now famous term, the invisible hand, really just meaning free markets not controlled by governments. The second was that each country has... Uh, an advantage in some products or another, some, some range of products to sell. Uh, it later became, Smith didn't use the term, but it later became known as comparative advantage, a term that was introduced by, uh, uh, introduced by the, another British economist, David Ricardo, and it meant that each country has certain advantages in certain things. The technicalities are fairly heavy going, and I won't try and explain all that, but... Um, uh, and the third point is that uh, each country can gain from trading uh, if they trade on the basis of their comparative advantage. So they should freely allow exchange between their country and other countries on the basis of selling these goods in which they have comparative advantage. This concept of comparative advantage is the absolute core of modern free trade theory, right up to the present day, even though all this was going on 200 years ago when they were inventing these terms, it's still the core of the main theory of globalisation and, and free trade. That's why, that's the point of having globalisation and free trade, according to all this, because uh, countries can do better, they can have higher income and so on, by trading in these uh, various... Um, various products and so on, in which they have uh, comparative advantage. And uh, I'll come back to this term and explain it a bit from time to time. So these are some of the main arguments here. By the way, these slides are really just sort of emphasising a bit what I'm saying here. But, uh, so it was supposed to be good to have free trade between countries. However, probably uh, you probably won't be falling over in surprise to know that um, pretty well right from the start of all these debates, governments largely ignored all this theory anyway. <laughs> they went on protecting things all the time. Right throughout the 19th century, much of the early 20th century, and in fact really until after the Second World War, governments continued to protect things, protect industries of all kinds, and this included the USA. The USA, the USA in the 19th century was quite protectionist. And uh, as you may or may not uh, understand, but you read some of the history books, history books on this and you'll uh, may be quite surprised. There was really only one major country in the world that had free trade for long periods of time, from uh, about a century, from the 1830s to the uh, 1930s, uh, and that was the UK. And um, there's lots of theories as to why they uh, did it, but uh, countries that lead the world industrially often have a, an advantage in a lot of things and they do well about it, although some historical studies question whether or not they did well. Research by an Irish economist, Kevin O'Rourke, suggests that this um, policy uh, of governments in practice of having protection was probably actually fairly successful. See, a lot of free trade economists, even today, a lot of free trade economists 
will say, oh, no, 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 it's not, not a good idea, it doesn't really work, and so on. But there's quite a lot of historical evidence that it did work. It particularly worked in helping to uh, develop industries, get them on their feet, and so on, uh, before um, they uh, suffered a lot of competition from other countries. All right, so... Um, uh, in fact, over time, economists even started to uh, realise this and have gradually accepted um, at least some uh, grounds for having protection. And... Uh, oh, that was an extra bit of key people, the ones I've just mentioned so far. So, uh, economists... Um, not all economists. Economists still, to this very day, are divided on this issue, but some economists started to accept that there were some grounds for intervention and protection into the markets. And uh, this included the infant industry argument that was uh, the idea that was uh, first put up by a German economist, Frederick List, who said, and I believe that it was uh, quite visionary, it's still valid, I believe, but industries often need help to get going. And then after a while, when they mature, they might need less help. He didn't want permanent protection, he just said, uh, industries often need protection in the early stages to get going. And historical evidence seems to bear this out quite well. But another thing that, uh, another ground for um, uh, protection was non-economic goals. Quite often governments want to have goals that are political rather than economic. So particularly defence and food security and so on. And I'll come back to some of these. Uh, however, of course, extreme free traders don't accept any of these. And they say, no, should never have protection. Uh, so um, those were those are some of those traditional grounds for protection, and I haven't gone into them all. The first one is fairly technical, but um, the uh, terms of trade, one where uh, if a, a large country might actually have to drop their prices if they start getting into world markets and so on, to, uh, in order to be able to sell things. But uh, we won't worry too much about that one. Now. Um, why all this controversy and uh, uh, disagreement of opinion? Well, the, the problem is that free trade and globalisation work, like so many things, so many ideas, they work better in theory than in practice. <laughs> Certainly my view. There'll be a lot of economists who will disagree, but... The theory underlying all this assumes uh, flexible, smooth, fast-acting free markets and so on, so that markets work very well, they move quickly and adjust flexibly and so on. However, the reality appears that uh, this is uh, not as simple as that at all. There can be there are slow adjustments, there can be monopolies, there can be labour exploitation, there can be dumping, which is where countries uh, export products below cost for st various strategic reasons. There can be uh, what sometimes called social dumping, that's where... Uh, uh, countries uh, develop industries and export, uh, ignoring other things like the environment and um, social issues or uh, assistance to poorer people and so on. They just want to export for the sake of exporting. Uh, and there can also be currency manipulation. And this is one that's often not talked about. Uh, com the comparative advantage concept I mentioned before is supposed to be based on a country's underlying costs. But, of course, if countries... Uh, manipulate the exchange rate, uh, that completely changes the whole underlying situation of the comparative advantage. And as you know, you've got a, at the moment a president who's uh, always accusing one particular country of doing this. Uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that lots of countries have done it though too, and it's mainstream economists have, uh, have argued this too. So all of these things can change the whole picture. It can undermine the concept of comparative advantage. So, uh, and of course, uh, and one final thing, of course, that can do this is industry policy that I've been referring to, the uh, protection to uh, create new industries and so on, by the, the use of various industry policy. So the result is a comparative advantage uh, can change, it can evolve, it can be manipulated, uh, it can be deliberately developed by governments. So it's something that's flexible and mobile and something it's, it's not set in concrete. So uh, that means that... Uh, there can be grounds for doing something. I mean, economists might say it's illegitimate to do that, but the reality is that comparative advantage 
does change over time. So the arguments for free trade that you should base trade on the basis of comparative advantage doesn't really work out in practice when the concept of comparative advantage is quite malleable and can change and can be changed deliberately by governments. And uh, just to complicate matters even further, as you probably know, uh, nowadays the global economy is highly interlinked through elaborate networks of uh, supply chains, usually dominated and led by transnational companies, which often uh, integrate trade and services, investment, finance all together, even migration sometimes, plus information flows, knowledge exchange, research and intellectual property. All these are all sort of bundled up in packages in which um, uh, these um, are all... Uh, uh, well, they're all integrated in a way that's, that's quite complicated. I'm, I'm sure you've read about this sort of thing. Now, some economists argue that this is now so complicated that it's difficult to... You can't really control this. So, therefore, why have protection? You should have free trade. But on the other hand, uh, this sort of um, uh, uh, global value change, as they're called, can give rise to numerous opportunities for monopoly, unfair practices, price manipulation, dumping again, exploitation, and even tax avoidance, which you've no doubt heard about with uh, working through uh, tax havens and so on. And so as a result of all that, um, you need to have various kinds of monitoring and regulation and cautious controls of various sorts and perhaps selective protection. So I, I would use that as an argument for some protection and intervention and so on. It should be cautious. It, you should look at your policies very carefully, but it, it, uh, it seems to be some grounds for intervention. In fact, overall, uh, I would argue that uh, trade uh, and external policies are just yet another area, like other aspects of the economy, uh, which need um, cautious, moderate regulation of all time. Different amounts of regulation for different policy areas, but it still needs regulation. There's a saying amongst British economists, I don't know, I've never heard Americans say it, it maybe a British expression uh, from the Keynesian period, uh, in which um, some people say that uh, the market, the free market, uh, is a good servant but a bad master. So let the market help you, but uh, don't let it dominate things, is the, is the idea. Now, furthermore, as the world economy gets even more and more complicated the more you look at it, today there's a vast array of free trade agreements of various kinds at all sorts of levels. There's only one overall body for the whole world called the World Trade Organisation, uh, and it sort of supervises, it doesn't uh, control policies, but uh, it supervises what uh, governments do, it tries to stop protection and so on, right down to regional units and agreements between particular countries. Uh, two that you'd be particularly familiar with in this country is NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and Mexico, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership was all agreed and set up to go, and your new president, of course, said he's going to dump it. But uh, those kinds of agreements uh, are now in place all around the world. And they aim to, uh, not all countries are in them, but most countries in the world now are part of some sort of agreements like this. Not all are. Brazil, I believe, is one country that's avoided a lot of these things, but they are in the World Trade Organisation, uh, the world body doing this. Most of these sorts of agreements try to restrict government's regulatory powers by banning or reducing tariffs and other things called non-tariff barriers, regulations over services, subsidies and other kinds of industry policies and all kinds of things. Free traders believe these are all terribly naughty and should be controlled, banned if possible, get rid of them and so on. This is the, the general sort of attitude. So uh, these, uh, the, these agreements are very prominent now, but uh, some countries uh, largely obey these kinds of rules. Some countries bend the rules and a few countries uh, cheat on these rules on a huge scale. 
countries that most, most notorious for that, of course, is China. All right, so uh, my main arguments against uh, having complete free trade and globalisation, remember I'm about the middle, so, uh, but I, I certainly argue having against having complete open slather free trade and globalisation. The three grounds that I argue. One is the, uh, uh, all countries sometimes want some kinds of non-economic goals. And sorry, I've lost track of my... Uh, Trade liberalisation, these are supposed to be the advantages. Um, um, oh no, sorry, I'll go back. Um, the non economic goals might include uh, defence and uh, food security and resource reserves and so on. Uh, Indonesia and China are doing that quite a lot at the moment. Uh, and cultural protection is very common uh, grounds for. Uh, having protection these days. Most countries in the world have protection for their uh, audio visuals and guess who they're having protection against? Against uh, Hollywood exports, of course. A general, the general concept of self-reliance and here I am talking moderation. I'm not talking about countries like North Korea and so on, which uh, uh, are extreme, have extreme emphasis on self-reliance. The second main grounds for arguing uh, is uh, the infant industry protection that I've already touched on, especially through uh, industry assistance policies and industry policies and so on that I've, that I've already talked about. It's very important to understand that uh, most countries have used these most of the time uh, throughout their history to some degree or another. Uh, they faded somewhat in the, amongst Western countries in the post-war period, but... Uh, in my uh, chapter four of my book, uh, I've looked at how uh, Japan, countries like Japan, South Korea and Taiwan had very exten extensive elaborate industry policies uh, in the, uh, oh, up to about the 1970s. And uh, they seemed to be very successful in establishing new industries. What they actually did is recreate the comparative advantage. They pushed the envelope and they created new comparative advantage. Uh, if they hadn't have done that, you could bet your boot South Korea wouldn't be export, wouldn't have Samsung and exporting all the cars and electronics and so on they do now. So, uh, however, most of these techniques are used have now been more or less banned by the World Trade Organization. And they did that because they believe it goes against free trade. <laughs> so, um, so we are sort of stuck with that at the moment. But... Um, all the same, uh, despite all of that, despite all the rules the WTO has, uh, countries still cheat on all these kinds of rules. And as I said before, the, uh, the, the chief cheater is China. And they do it quite un uh, unashamedly. China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 and uh, ever since then they've provided various kinds of hidden subsidies to modern industries for industrial development and uh, all kinds of special loans and deals with state banks and state enterprises and so on. Of course, the economy is very heavily controlled by the government and they've got all kinds of ways in which they can do that. Currently, China has a, a new plan called Made in China 2025, which seeks to build up sectors such as uh, IT, robotics, pharmaceuticals, aviation, renewable energy and so on, with a view to catching up with the West and all sorts of fronts. And they use all kinds of things like what's called national champions, big companies that will push things, uh, policies favouring local firms, local content quotas, local procurement by government, all kinds of things like that. Most of these are, are banned by the, the World Trade Organisation. And um, But uh, China keeps on doing them. Now, the question is, uh, are they naughty? Are they cheating? You know, should we try to stop them? There have been lots of appeals to the WTO, especially by the USA, against this kind of thing. But um, I take a slightly different view. I think there's a reason why governments do this sort of thing, and that's because industry policy does work uh, because of infant industry uh, advantages. And uh, trying to stop them is probably like Puritans wanting to try and ban sex. <laughs> and in fact, this is a very heretical position of mine that I, I suggest uh, 
that uh, we probably should be looking at the trading rules and looking at uh, the possibility of some kind of revision of the world's trading rules to allow more flexibility. All right, so that's a second. Now, my third grounds for opposing complete free trade and, and globalisation is that the costs of these things may now be outweighing the benefits. The, uh, slide seven, yeah. uh, those are the, some of the so supposed advantages of... Uh, well, they, they are genuine advantages of uh, free trade. Uh, lower import prices, uh, it can boost to export, uh, technological development through imports, higher income, perhaps more employment and economic growth. These are supposed to be things that are happening. Some are and some aren't. Um, some of the early... Uh, what happened when uh, the, uh, this was being done in, say, from about the 1980s onwards, uh, and at that stage uh, there were a lot of pioneer uh, computer technocrats who started looking at this sort of thing and trying to calculate it. Some of the early projections were that these kinds of advantages could add up to anything up to 10% of GDP. That's the kind of thing they said when the European Union was being set up. Could be worth 10% of GDP, which is quite huge. I mean, that, that would be a lot. Uh, only one problem. It didn't happen <laughs> anywhere near that sort of benefit. Around the time that the uh, World Trade Organization was being set up, the computer models were projecting something more like about 1% of GDP for most countries. Less for some. Then when they started some years back when they were negotiating this Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, the projections then were only for about 0.4 to 0.7% of GDP, with Australia and America being among the lower bound there, only about 0.4% of GDP, which is uh, relatively small. For the USA, for instance, this uh, amounted to about $450 per person over time, usually on a specified time period, which if you calculate it, is barely enough for an extra cup of coffee per week for <laughs> every American. So, uh, you know, you're not really looking at very high stakes, even though the politicians keep on telling us how marvellous it is. And, uh, in fact, after all, the USA had a lot of free trade agreements and, uh, in recent years, and most of these agreements uh, after with various Asian countries, after they made these agreements, uh, their uh, trade balance with most countries went down. So those are all in the pre-Trump era, so perhaps they hadn't really caught up with the art of the deal at that stage. Somebody had uh, made some rather bad deals by the looks of it. Um, even more uh, striking is that um, uh, cost of free trade. Or, um, is that uh, I've got myself mixed up with those slides now a bit. But, uh, a study of um, trade agreements with between Australia and Asian countries recently uh, forecast benefits of uh, 0.05 to. 0.1% of GDP. Now, um, I've got a, what's the next one with numbers on it? Uh, so they may have the following cost. Okay, so I've jumbled those up a little bit. Um, some numbers. So uh, there's some of the ones I mentioned. And these, are, these are down here, down the bottom. Just in case you didn't hear that properly, the, the, this was modelling done for the Australian government. The benefits uh, were... 0.05% uh, to 0.1% of GDP. The 0.05 means half of one-tenth of 1% 1 of GDP. <laughs> so uh, you're looking at numbers that are getting pretty trivial. The Australian Prime Minister at the time said that uh, these deals are about jobs, jobs, jobs. You know how politicians stood up in Parliament, jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, but the projections for, uh, in the government's own document, this, this stuff was in the government's own document, projected for 3,500 jobs by 2035, which is 0.04% of the Australian workforce. So uh, almost a joke. And uh, I don't know why politicians like to go on making themselves look so silly, making these statements, but uh, 
He obviously didn't read the government's own document with this. What happens is that these agreements are made because uh, they benefit certain industries and the industries push those and uh, they uh, neglect the general interest of the, uh, of the population. In fact, that's really what a lot of these agreements are about now. They're about particular sectors wanting to get what's called market access into these other countries. But uh, most economists agree that, that, that it should be about the general interests of the whole country. But uh, when you look at these sorts of figures, uh, you know, where are the, the general interests lie? All right, so that's the benefits or supposed benefits. As regards costs of free trade and globalisation, there are amazingly few... I've got these jumbled up, so I'll go back. That's a graph. I might come back to it. Uh, so a list of various sorts of costs there. There's amazingly few studies of the possible costs of free trade and globalisation. Uh, globalisation was supposed to increase growth rates. And, uh, oh, sorry, I've jumped back there a bit. Uh, one of the, the, the benefits overall was supposed to be increased economic growth rates. And, um, in fact, if anything, uh, it's just simply, that's a, a graph that's in my book, please on me. You can see the, the rates of economic growth worldwide have just been sort of continuously going down throughout the global era. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, a lot of factors for that. It's not just... I'm not saying all blame on globalisation, but... Uh, uh, it's, uh, but certainly globalisation has not been... Of this, had the sort of benefits that were uh, projected. As regards costs... Um, where is that now? Uh, no, I think it was back, wasn't it? As regards costs, these can be, uh, uh, be all sorts of uh, amazing uh, problems that can go wrong. These have been largely ignored by economists. When introducing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which Australia was supposed to have been a member, Australia's Trade Minister mentioned only the alleged benefits. He only he stood up in Parliament and only talked about benefits. No cost at all, as though they didn't exist. Moreover, he refused to commission a cost-benefit analysis of the, the agreement. So one has to wonder what he was hiding. Uh, he later went out of politics fairly soon after that and got a job with a company that was making big deals with China, but who knows, that was probably irrelevant. <laughs> Giving him the benefit of the doubt, perhaps. The cost can include revenue losses for governments, job losses from imports and offshoring, uh, loss or decline of certain industries, uh, costs for workers in shifting and retraining, uh, lower wages. Many workers, when they lose their jobs, uh, they, if they get re-employed, and it can take quite a while, very often it's at much lower wages. Uh, the cost to the governments of unemployment benefits for workers who can't get new jobs and so on, long-term unemployment, psychological effects of all this kind of thing and so on. Environmental impacts, you can even get financial instability, but that's uh, probably a bit too complicated to explain now. I've got a whole chapter on that in the book. The overall balance between costs and benefits is always a bit tricky to try and work out. But um, there, uh, the, the, somewhere along the line, there, there is a balance. There is... Uh, uh, the people who say globalisation has been so wonderful... I've got a cheeky term for them, I'll call them glo globo euphorists, who attribute all good things to globalisation. And one thing you hear very often, credibly often, is that they say that uh, even some critics of globalisation say globalisation has reduced world poverty. But, uh, you know, there's this, that, and the other problems as well, even if they admit to other costs. It seems to have been uh, a mark of faith. Everyone seems to think that globalisation has reduced world poverty. Now, world poverty has gone down quite substantially during the global era, but in my chapter, chapter 7 my book, I had a critical look at that, and I'm not completely convinced either that there's a close connection between globalisation and economic growth, uh, that other chart suggested, 
uh, or that globalisation was responsible for uh, declining world poverty. And uh, I had a close look at it and I suggest that uh, declining world poverty, and it's still a lot, unfortunately, around the world, but uh, has been mainly due to probably homegrown economic growth processes and uh, redistributive policies. Uh, most countries around the world have had very extensive redistributive policies and uh, they seem to have been very effective in reducing poverty. It hasn't reduced in inequality because that's been another cost that I haven't had time to mention. Inequalities have been going up because of a lot of these problems. However, because most uh, countries of the world have specifically targeted reducing poverty, that's been fairly successful. Uh, but then, of course, uh, free market globalists can't admit that because that means government is effective. <laughs> Government's been doing a good job. Most economists now acknowledge that there are some costs of globalisation, but they tend to claim that they're very small and a standard uh, idea in the literature is that perhaps about 10% or less of the benefits from free trade and trade liberalisation and so on. But uh, there are contrary studies and the, uh, this picture is changing. Too many people ignore them. There is uh, a, a not very well known US economist called Carl Davidson, excellent scholar who should be better known perhaps, uh, who's looked at a lot of these costs of retraining and so on and he says that the costs can range from 30% up to 80% of the benefits of the, the, the trade liberalisation. The reason why it's so high is that uh, he said retraining costs can be extremely high, especially if you've got to retrain workers to a much higher levels of skill, which tends not to happen. And in a country like the US or Australia, if you're upgrading, you've got to actually increase your skills to a very high level, and that can be quite expensive. You've got to get uh, hundreds of thousands of workers, engineering degrees just about, you know, it's very expensive, very costly. There is a, a quite a famous study by uh, uh, a, uh, a chap called uh, David Utor and um, his college. I think he's uh, down at Harvard. I'm not sure now. Uh, he's looked at these kinds of impacts, especially of the China trade. They've found that uh, uh, imports from China alone have cost probably two and a half million jobs in America, which is a quarter of all manufacturing jobs lost over the last couple of decades. And they've done a very thorough study of local government areas and they found that long-term employment and adjustment costs have been huge, much higher than has been generally acknowledged. And uh, it, uh, I haven't got time to go into the details, it's excellent. The book is, their study is cited in my book. And they come up with this amazing conclusion that uh, this is so much so that all of those costs and all the unemployment benefits that people have got to get because of this quite possibly have swallowed up almost all the benefits that may have come from trade liberalisation and freer trade. So in other words, it is quite possible that the costs may be starting to outweigh the benefits of free trade and globalisation. If you looked at all the problems that have been created, all the impacts on people, all the impacts on regions, etc., you know, it all adds up. All right, so in conclusion, I do not advocate a return to very high protection or radical deglobalisation, although some people do. But I suggest at least a, mod, uh, a modest program that goes like this. Um, sorry, which slide's that? Slide 10. Um, all of those. And uh, uh, policies. Yeah, I uh, mix the numbers up, but slide 11, but anyway. First, I, uh, I think it is absolutely crucial that we monitor all costs and benefits free trade proposes. I just told you about the Australian Trade Minister, ignoring costs. We really must do the studies of all costs and benefits. Number two, uh, trade negotiations must be in public, not in secret. It's the present. I don't know whether you followed this sort of thing. But believe it or not, all, this, the, the, uh, all the entire negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership were almost completely in secret, certainly in the US, certainly in Australia, uh, much of Europe. Uh, and no one found out about what was going on and basically until it was revealed, although WikiLeaks did uh, release some stuff, but it was in almost incomprehensible form. So, uh, Three, uh, 
A wide range of groups must be involved and consulted, not just business. I think I've changed these numbers a bit, or abbreviated a bit, but... Uh, for... Uh, yes, I have cut out a couple from that, but uh, you can read that. Governments uh, should retain policy options, and they didn't use them all the time, policy options, including tariffs in certain circumstances, anti-dumping duties, uh, um, <clears throat> some industry policy, uh, policies for uh, uh, regulating or trying to penalise other countries for currency manipulation, uh, and so on. They should always be done on the basis of cost-benefit analysis. You should do cost-benefit analysis of your policies as well. But, uh, and I also argue that the World Trade Organisation should be more flexible and start uh, trying to uh, look at uh, a more flexible approach. Uh, and the final one uh, is uh, my number five here. It's not number five there. I'll change it a bit. Uh, of course, there must be much more comprehensive adjustment and retraining programs for people who are affected by all of this. And uh, even even if those increase costs, believe it or not, there are some economists who say, uh, we really need to ignore the costs, because if we, if we start looking at costs, you know what's going to happen. Some do-gooder <laughs> protesters are going to say, oh, there's this and that cost and so on, and you'll end up uh, swallowing up all the benefits, which, have, as I just noted before, some mainstream economists are saying, well, that's, that's what's happening. So uh, we just have to put up with it and... Uh, the possibility that the costs may be close to or even outweighing the benefits. So, my final conclusion is that free trade and globalisation uh, do not constitute a moral imperative or an assured virtue. As I said like 20 years ago, you were getting politicians, including your President Clinton, saying that sort of thing, you know. We've got to do it. We've simply got to do it. We've got no alternative. And I don't believe that's true. The benefits and costs must be weighed up carefully with decisions made more democratically if we are to avoid what I've called damaging over-globalisation. Some 40 years ago, 40 years of trade liberalisation have shown that free trade and globalisation are not as good as claimed. The World Trade Organisation and other agreements are based on free market neoliberal assumptions. When they were set up, the reason why they did all these things was they simply assumed that free markets were best. And now <coughs> we can see that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and the result was a very over-optimistic approach to uh, free trade and globalisation and policy making. And uh, I say now, uh, well, well past time to have a, a good reality check for all these issues. All right, I hope you understood all that. Thank you uh, Thank for listening. You. If you have any questions, there are microphones on both sides. So raise your hand and get the microphone first before you ask a question. We have a question right here in the center. Mm -hmm. It appears that certain agreements, particularly the Trans Pacific, the late Trans Pacific Agreement, <clears throat> have major political uh, benefits or potential political benefits well beyond the economic. You don't include those in your discussion of cost and benefits. Would you comment? No, so can you repeat the last bit? Or? It appears that certain trade agreements may have major political and diplomatic benefits above and beyond the economic. And that may have been one of the major factors, I would have thought, in the presumed, in the past attempt to get a Trans-Pacific plan. That is to maintain, to a significant extent, our foothold in the Far West. Um, yes, um, well, uh, in fact, the Trans-Pacific, some, a lot of commentators said the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a political deal for it. And uh, Obama uh, was, mainly had politics in mind. Actually, he was even calling the general underlying policy the, the pivot to Asia, I think, was the popular jargon of the time. Uh, and the US might become more involved in Asia and all that kind of thing. So that's probably true. Uh, some people saying that uh, you know, most of these agreements are more about politics and economics now. 
So that might be true, but I mean, if if you want to get closer to other countries and make uh, political agreements with them and have a better understanding, uh, you can do that through all kinds of other channels. Uh, you, you don't need an economic agreement in which the uh, the costs may well outweigh the benefits. And by the way, the, uh, the figures I was quoting on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the supposed benefits that were very low, remember the 04 to 0.7% of GDP, they were by mainstream economists at the Peter Peterson Institute in Washington. They were the mainstream figures. There's a group uh, uh, of researchers down the road somewhere at Tufts University, that's not far away, I think, is, um, who uh, uh, looked at costs more closely and uh, more critically at the benefits, and they came up with an even more unfavourable estimate of what they were. So I don't... Uh, I think it, it's a curious sort of logic... Uh, if that's what the politicians are doing, to have these, uh, uh, these well, let's face it, uh, rather stupid, possibly, <laughs> arguably, rather stupid economic agreements, uh, have all these costs and problems and all that sort of thing, uh, to substitute for diplo uh, as a diplomatic measure. So uh, some people say it was, they were trying to, uh, it was trying to keep China out of the picture too, because China, of course, wasn't in the trans pacific Partnership. So China is now saying, oh, well, we're going to run our own agreements and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot, a lot of politics and diplomacy in it, but uh, I'm not sure that's the way to solve the problem. But, uh... Yeah, thank you. Um, I how do moral and legal issues such as human rights and agreements about uh, climate change and global warning, warming fit into your distinctions between globalization and internationalization? Your, your sense of globalization seems to be exclusively uh, focused on issues of trade and economics and uh, finance, but I also didn't see these issues uh, come up in your sense of internationalization either. Do, do you think nation, do you think we should have international standards on topics such as human rights and climate change or should nations be allowed to go their own way and each set up their own uh, viewpoints on these matters? Mm. Yes, well, that, that, that's why I've made the distinction between internationalization and globalization. So because glo globalization restricts what governments can do in terms of economic <laughs> policy. Whereas internationalisation and that's and it's integration, trying to integrate countries in the supposed interests of a um, more flexible, uh, non-discriminatory world order. But uh, internationalisation is cooperation, you know, in my definitions, and uh, that's why I make the distinction. No, I'm not opposed to uh, having all kinds of international standards for, you know, dealing with the environment and things like that, and. Uh, Working through the United Nations, even though uh, even though the United Nations uh, has, has some curious aspects to it, uh, um, because you probably you may or may not know that the uh, Human Rights Commission of the United Nations has uh, recently admitted some wonderful new members of the, the uh, Russia, of Saudi Arabia, of China, <laughs> and amongst other countries. But. Um, so one wonders uh, what that means for uh, human rights standards. Uh, no, I, I certainly strongly support those kinds of things. And that's why I've made the distinction between the two. So internationalisation uh, is cooperation between countries for doing all kinds of things like this. Uh, and I agree there that countries should be willing to sacrifice some degree of sovereignty and uh, on those kinds of things. And I consider those sorts of things more important. Economists say, so, oh, they're sort of side issues. But I, I personally consider those actually much more important, which is why I think a government should be prepared to sacrifice some of their sovereignty. OK, we have a gentleman here in the centre. Hi. A, uh, about a year and a half ago, I happened to be in Australia visiting for a while. And at that point, uh, there was in the news about China purchasing, I think, either a beef farm or a dairy farm someplace in Australia. Uh, you may remember that brouhaha about that incident. Could you comment on 
the kinds of things that a non-capitalist society like China, I mean, to some extent, it is mixed capitalism in a way now, or some sort of capitalism. But China's pursuing a different kind of policy in the world, it seems to me, with their work in Africa, their work in South America and Latin America, uh, in the rest of Asia. They are not buying into free trade. They have a very different kind of economic nationalism policy uh, of worldwide integration and worldwide uh, interconnection going on, uh, mostly bilateral agreements with individual countries, I think, that are you know, sort of uh, uh, agreements between a lion and a lamb oftentimes. Um, it's a different model for globalization and integration that's not the capitalist free trade model at all. Could you just comment on those? It's almost like a different world system's emerging there. Yes, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure that all of this is very heavily uh, uh, system dependent. Um, capitalist and socialist countries can coexist and can cooperate and all that sort of thing, so long as they don't behave like North Korea. But uh, so um, yeah, I'm in I'm in two minds about it because uh, I I quite like some of the things that China's doing in terms of their economic model. But uh, I think they I was been in China recently and their their, their politics are absolutely appalling. So uh, I've been to Tibet and places like that and the levels of security, police state security and so on, are horrendous. But uh, China. China is the most curious country in the world because of the its ambivalence and the way it fits in with the, or doesn't fit in with things. I think China is trying to have its cake and eat it. <laughs> uh, it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, and they said, "Oh, we're going to obey all the rules," and uh, they reduced a lot of tariffs and they did this and that. And the World Trade Organization now puts out reports saying China's wonderful. You know, they've cut, they're down to they they had tariffs that were nearly a hundred percent. Of the value of imported products before, and now they're down to about ten percent and so on. But with all the cheating that I was talking about before, uh, some American economists have estimated that China's uh, levels of support and protection are probably about thirty percent or more of industrial production. So they've still got very high levels of protection. So, um, so why, uh, how can they get away with that? How can they pull the wool over the eyes of the World Trade Organization? I cheat, quite literally. They, they don't announce those levels of support and so on. Many of them are secret. There's a, a couple, um, Usa and George Haley from, uh, I'm not sure what university they are in America here, but they uh, took them 10 years and they speak and read Chinese fluently. They had to go over there and look at what kinds of things were being done on the ground before they could eventually deduce. The USA has... Uh, protested to the, the World Trade Organization against China's, many of China's policies. In some cases, it's taken four or five years for the case to go through. So in some cases, America won, in some cases, China won, in some cases, they end up making a, a deal. But in a lot of these cases, it took so long for it to go through all the bureaucracy that uh, by the time it was all over, well, China had well and truly established that particular industry anyway that they were trying to subsidise. And, of course, China's going through all this uh, economic diplomacy worldwide. By, uh, they're going around the world saying, uh, well, look, you, you just, you know, we'll help you. We'll give you this, that and the other assistance and so on. And we won't insist on these silly things like human rights and so on. And, uh, that, well, they're quite literally saying that because China doesn't worry about human rights, so they don't see why anyone else needs to. And uh, they're assisting a lot of countries on that kind of basis. And they've now got a thing called the Belt and Road Initiative in which they're assisting countries all around Europe, all around Asia. And uh, so it's... In other words, China's a mixed bag. Uh, they're going along with some of the international rules. In other cases, they're going behind countries' backs. In other, words, in other cases, they're breaking the rules. <laughs> they're doing all sorts of things. So it's hard to generalise the way let alone predict where where it's all going to end up with China. But, uh, is that right? Does that answer what you're wondering? Or is that... Well, partly. <laughs> partly. Perhaps we're going to have a chat about it afterwards. Expect, I think. 
it's only um, I guess I was thinking more of the of the kind of economic diplomatic uh, deals that China is making around the world with individual countries to provide you know capital uh, labor forces. Oftentimes there will be a loan or a gift uh, to a country for an infrastructure project, but it'll come with 15, 20,000 Chinese workers coming in to actually do the work mm -hmm. and get the, the payroll. Um, this is not the way that most U.S. financial systems work overseas. China seems to have a different model mm. that harks back to uh, an earlier age, in a way, of uh, more national interest uh, driving the economics very clearly. Mm. That's all I was kind of getting at is to what you, I thought you might know a lot more about this than, than the little bit that I knew. Yeah. Um well, again, I mean, China's just such a mixed bag. At one stage, they were going to Africa, for instance, and uh, probably the cases you were talking about, and saying, we'll do all these things. We'll build a railway, we'll do this, this and that and so on. And our, our approach will be socialist. Uh, we're going to send some Chinese workers over there, but they'll be just given local pay, the same pay as African workers get. And they will live in the same sort of um, accommodation that Af the African workers have and so on, and uh, various other things like that. We'll, we'll cooperate with you and so on. We'll be very generous, etc. And as time went on, it turned out that they weren't quite so generous. Uh, uh, a lot of those countries discovered that uh, actually a lot of these, uh, the, 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 a lot of this stuff was aid, uh, it was loans, not aid, and they got to pay it back eventually. And uh, a lot of cases, the Chinese workers who were sent to those countries were actually pretty dissatisfied with the accommodation, asked for something better. And after a while, they did start getting quite a lot higher pay than the African workers and uh, started becoming fairly bossy and uh, they become quite unpopular in a lot of areas. I don't know about everywhere. But, uh, so that was supposed to be socialist, but it ended up... Uh, I don't know whether it was capitalist, though, but a bit imperialist. <laughs> similar way to uh, lots of the, uh, we know from history, <laughs> it's happened elsewhere. But, uh. Any more questions? I guess I have one question. Um, we had a uh, free trader here in the center a few years ago. His name was Benjamin Powell, and he had a lecture titled Sweatshops Improving Lives and Driving Economic Growth. And just on the topic of reducing global poverty, I know you said there could be other factors involved, and you suggested a few. But his argument was that we have countries around the globe that a few generations ago were third world countries that have now moved um, into mature economies that we associate with the first world. He, he gave like Hong Kong, to a lesser degree China, Japan. I was just wondering if you, if you could comment more on global manufacturing and um, elaborate a little bit on your thoughts on whether it really does um, depend more on internal policies within the countries and not so much on, the, on their involvement um, mm. in those networks as far as their um, mm. economic prosperity rising and their economies maturing. Yeah. yeah, well, I mentioned several times that um, most countries in the world have used protection at various stages, um, including the USA, but that was mainly in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. In the post-war period, uh, the countries that... Um, well, probably the countries that did best were countries that used very uh, interventionist policies. Taiwan, South Korea, Japan uh, mentioned. A lot of countries also, I, I've mentioned in the book, and in, I've got an appendix to my book, which I, uh, I've got growth charts for quite a lot of countries around the world, not about 30 countries around the world, a sample of countries. And uh, it's very clear from that uh, and in my chapter four, I analyse it, that the highest periods of economic growth uh, in a lot of countries, lot of, in South America, countries like Brazil and so on, was the period in which they used protectionist, interventionist policies or what economists called uh, import substitution and so on. Um, if your colleague has mentioned Hong Kong, uh, there are a number of writers in this field that said... Uh, there's only one country in the third world that's developed without these kinds of interventionist policies, and that's Hong Kong. 
And even then they intervene <laughs> more than you'd think. Like they uh, it's got a, quite a strong government control housing scheme to make sure that people have got adequate housing. And uh, there was a huge debate about this at one stage. At one stage, the World Bank, uh, which, as you know, is an international body that's funded by the, most, mostly by the richer countries, and they used to give orders to countries, you know, you should do this or do that. If you want a loan, you've got to use free market policies, you can't use industry policies, you can't do this, that or the other. And at one stage, they were putting out all these reports which said the countries that are doing best are the ones that are most globalised or the most open. And that idea, uh, and, and the countries that are much less open and globalised are not doing as well in terms of economic growth and some other criteria. And that idea shot around the world you know, like lightning. Everyone was quoting a journalist everywhere were writing in the newspapers about that. So a lot of economists went to work on the statistics and they started looking at the modelling that was used for that. And um, particularly two economists, Rodriguez and... Um, and Roderick, Danny Roderick, who's down here at Harvard, brilliant economist, and they looked at the modelling that was used and they said, well, they did this and that and the model did this and that and all that kind of thing. And the definitions they used were open or dubious and so on. If you redefine it and look at a more realistic sort of model, that wasn't really true at all. It was actually hard to say uh, whether the countries that were most open uh, were doing better or not because of the market. And in fact, that whole idea, some people still seem to have that idea, but that whole idea went out in the, in the 2000s, particularly after that paper by uh, Rodriguez and, uh, and Roderick. And um, there was a curious sidelight to it. I mentioned in the book, but I don't know whether anyone else has ever picked it up. In 2002, the World Bank put out a, a, a report, it was quoted everywhere, that said that, what I just said, globalised countries are doing better. That in 2005... They put out another report that's had hardly any publicity around the world. There was a different group of people doing it, but in that report, they said, um, oops, um, we made a bit of a mistake. <laughs> it wasn't quite that simple. <laughs> the, uh, the countries that have had intervention and industry policies have done fairly well. Uh, the countries that had open markets and all that kind of thing haven't done as well as we thought. They did all right at first, but they're not doing too well now. <laughs> all this kind of thing. So, in other words, they modified all of those conclusions. And it was quite remarkable, that turnabout. But that report, perhaps not surprisingly, didn't get much, didn't get much um, publicity at all. And, uh, in fact, I've looked through the, a couple of my chapters, chapter three and four, looked at the evidence of links between globalisation and growth. And... Uh, I wouldn't say, this is again why I'm down the middle, uh, the evidence is not strong one way or the other for or against globalisation. The evidence is quite ambiguous as to whether that's the case. Uh, and you don't get very many um, uh, people now trying to argue that globalisation is the, is the best way to do it. When the European Union was first set up, they did all these projections that I might have mentioned, 10% economic growth you know, from the integration and so on. That never happened. And they've gradually revised it down to the point where uh, I read somewhere that uh, the, the European Commission, which is the head of body of the European Union, doesn't even put out those studies now. The apparent reason is that the results are too embarrassing. <laughs> They're not showing that much economic advantage from the integration that's been going on. So... Uh, so uh, I'm not sure where that leaves us, but it means that the whole question of uh, the free, market, free markets, free trade, globalisation and so on was so good for economies, uh, really hasn't worked out. The evidence is simply not there. And I've gone into it pretty thoroughly and other people are reaching that conclusion now too. So. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.